Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Mark Twain said, why not go out on a limb? That's where the fruit is. I tell you how you can go out on a limb to get that fruit, that prosperity in your life, and an update on markets and housing here in the new decade today on Get Rich Education. Finally, with Total Control Financial, get checkbook control of your existing 401k and IRA funds to invest in real estate. Yes, you can move your retirement money into your own checking account, but you must avoid the little-known tax that you'll get hammered with in a self-directed IRA. Instead, start your QRP. Learn more and get your free copy of the QRP book by text messaging QRP in all capital letters to 72000. The company that's provided our listeners with more loans than anyone is Ridge Lending Group, NMLS 42056. You can finance more than 10 single families up to fourplexes. Serving most U.S. states, their knowledge and experience leads to your financial freedom. They're number one in the investment space. Pre-qualify and then chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. Start on your next investment property loan right now at RidgeLendingGroup.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. This is episode 275. And you know something? It has always just absolutely fascinated me that people will trade their time for dollars. You have traded your time for dollars, and I have sold my time for money in the past as well. Yeah, it amazes me that people will work often doing something that they don't even like and spend that time away from their family or for things that they don't enjoy doing just for money. And it's actually even worse than that. The long-term plan, the outcome for these decades of sacrifice isn't even satisfying. It's for you to retire old and only then begin to really live maybe. Well, ironically, the answer to your potential freedom is something that you actually slept inside last night, a piece of real estate. But you need to invest in real estate in a strategic way. You don't need to be a landlord and you don't need to know how to fix things, but few know the way. Here on this show, I simply tell you the things that I would have wanted to know before I started down this road to freedom back in 2002, which is when I bought that seminal fourplex building You are where you are today because of you, and your life isn't a fluke, and your life isn't an accident either. You are where you are because of your choices. Well, let me ask you, were you meant to be doing what you're doing now? Were you put on this earth to do that? You probably know definitively without me even having to get specific. You already know, yes or no, if you were meant to be doing what you do for money now. See, the number one limiting reason that people give for why they can't do something that they really want to do in their life is money. So time versus money is something that we discuss a lot here on the show. It's something that's infinitely interesting to me. And what you need to do is go out on a limb. I'm going to discuss that with you a lot more today. But first, since we're a few weeks into this new decade, let's talk about some more broad and contemporaneous news items, this investor environment that you live inside every day. Whipping around the asset classes like we do here from time to time, in the year that was last year, what really happened? The S&P 500 was up nearly 29%, its best performance in years. And of course, it's volatile. In fact, it was just down 6% the previous year. Year over year, many commodities were up. Gold was up 18%, silver up 15%, oil, light sweet crude, was up 22%. Recession fears, they peaked back in September four months ago. 
columnists and economists and everyday people, they just don't really talk about recession as much as they did late last year. Last year, the 10-year Treasury note fell 7 tenths of 1% down to 1.9%. Now, why do you care about what you'll hear people just shorten and call the 10-year T-note? Economists say it that way with their slang. This is because that's the rate most closely tied to long-term mortgage interest rates. I just told you that the note yield fell 7 tenths of 1% last year. We'll see the most popular mortgage in America. It fell 8 tenths of 1% last year down to 3.7%. That's the 30-year loan. So pretty closely correlated, 7 tenths and 8 tenths. And of course, that's the mortgage interest rate for primary residences there, that 3.7%. For investment property, it's often nearly 1% higher. Last year, the Freddie Mac house price index was up 3.6%. I like to look at the Freddie Mac index because it includes pricing for all 50 states and Washington, D.C. The K. Schiller housing price index only measures 10 to 20 large cities. One news story that we experienced in the past year is one that almost no one talks about. Now, you generally want there to be higher wages out there. That means your tenants can afford to pay you more rent. Higher wages mean higher inflation, which means higher asset prices and also faster debasement of the mortgage debt that you owe. Now, whether you agree that there should be a minimum wage or not, the minimum wage keeps getting higher across the country. More than 20 states are bumping up pay for minimum wage workers this year, here in 2020, while Seattle's large employers will now pay a nationwide high of at least $16.39 to employees. Meanwhile, the federal minimum wage, that still remains parked at $7.25, but these higher state wages, that's a real positive for real estate investors. Now, I've aggregated a number of news stories that matter to you. All of these have published over the past few weeks, and just about everything is positive for a stable housing environment. Zillow just reported a figure that I think is going to astonish you. Over the last decade, do you have any idea how much Americans paid in rent in total? Americans paid $4.5 trillion, with a T, dollars in rent in the last decade, the decade that just ended a couple weeks ago, the 2010s. Well, that's a gigantic number, and I think it's so giant, it's really more of a fun figure to contemplate and hard to put it into context. What can you compare this to? Well, this is greater than the GDP of Germany, which is the world's fourth largest economy. Yes, it's been a rather lucrative decade for landlords, partly due to the fact that the homeownership rate has generally fallen through the decade, and consequently, there are more renters now. So yes, you only need a small slice of this $4.5 trillion pie to win a substantial degree of financial freedom for yourself. Housing Wire has updated us on what the median age of a home buyer is in America today. Do you have any idea what that age is? Any guess? Well, I'll tell you first, to give you some context here, that in 1981, which is the year that Ronald Reagan first became president, the median age of a home buyer then was 31 years old, age 31 back in 1981. The median age of a home buyer today is higher than that, just dramatically higher, almost unbelievably higher. It is age 47. 47. So how did this happen? Well, there are various reasons for this delay, including a dramatic increase in student loan debt, like we've discussed here before, and a general shifting of attitudes toward the traditional homebuyer cycle. People are waiting longer to marry and have kids and buy houses. Household formation is postponed now. These are some things that you've already realized, but you just might be surprised to learn that the result of this is now a 47-year-old median age home buyer. That's like old enough to be a grandparent, perhaps. Just remarkable. And again, great news if you're renting property to others. People are renting longer or even renting forever. 
Now, understand something else. And look, you cannot discriminate against any tenant based on age or for any other reason. But just think about what else this means. There's a renter pool today that's different than it used to be. It might, say, have more 35 and 40-year-olds in it than there used to be, and therefore a smaller proportion of 25 years old. So you have this aging of tenants, and older tenants tend to live more quietly in your property and be more gentle on your housing unit. Long-term demographic trends exactly like these are why we talk about what we talk about here, how everyday busy people and working professionals, people like you can create residual income with these investment properties. CoreLogic expects a 5.4% home price jump in 2020. Yes, this would be a greater appreciation rate than that 3.6% we saw last year. Fannie Mae has significantly boosted its 2020 housing forecast as well. Overall housing demand, they say, is incredibly high, especially at the lower end of the market, which is exactly the end of the market where builders are least active. Prices are rising fastest on this low end, and that helps to sideline some of these would-be first-time homebuyers. Fannie Mae's chief economist, Doug Duncan, says housing appears poised to take a leading role in real GDP growth over the forecast horizon for the first time in years, further bolstering our modest but solid growth forecasts through the year 2021. Now, CNBC recently reported that U.S. home builders and lenders are to blame for the country's housing shortage. That's what Marcus and Millichap CEO Hassan Naji said. Home construction companies have reduced speculation and lowered risk taking in an effort to prevent those overbuilding lessons, if you will, that they learn in the 2008 and 2009 housing crisis and Great Recession and keep that from happening again. That's what he said. All of that is frustrating from a consumer perspective, but it's actually very healthy from an investment and economic perspective for the U.S. as a whole, is what he said. Yahoo Finance, really all these news outlets are reporting various sources that home prices are expected to rise modestly and that housing shortages are going to continue. And rather than reporting on another similar story about this, I've been saying this for years on this show, that if you're waiting for home prices to drop substantially, well, anything is possible, but I don't see what could make that happen still. And that's primarily due to three or four reasons that housing stays firm. And this is me talking now. We're done with the articles. The number one reason housing stays firm is that housing demand still exceeds supply. That is just basic economics. And the housing crash of now 13 years ago, that was due to the opposite condition. Back then, there was this speculative overbuilding. That's when supply exceeded demand. The second reason is that appreciation rates are sustainable, less than 4% per annum lately. And leading up to the housing crash, they were 10 times that in some markets. That was totally unsustainable. The third reason that supports housing is that lending practices are responsible. To get a loan, you do need to supply a somewhat annoyingly high amount of documentation, and you do need to have income, and you do need to have reserves, and you do need to have some decent credit. Well, that didn't happen in the Great Recession buildup either. Back then, anyone qualified, and then that artificial demand helped push up home prices unsustainably. Really, a fourth reason or a bonus is that once you adjust for inflation, which so many people and even reporting outlets forget to do, many housing markets still haven't even reached their pre-recession peak from way back in 2005. So these four reasons are all reasons to be bullish about housing. Links to all the articles that I said it earlier are in the show notes. Next week, Tom Wheelwright returns to the show with me. Yes, it's the long-awaited show where it'll be Weinhold and Wheelwright on 401ks and going deep on how you can obtain the desired real estate professional designation and the great tax advantages that it can give you. Are 401ks worth contributing to even if you get a dollar per dollar employer match? We're going to take that one head on next week, and I think you're going to get some really surprising answers. During the holidays a while back, we had all fresh shows. 
San Diego-based Get Rich Education listener Andrew Stanton and his layoff story reminded us of the importance of having multiple income streams. Should you, as they say, rent out your backyard with an ADU, an accessory or auxiliary dwelling unit? Well, in places like California where they're popular, why don't you instead enjoy your backyard and invest in markets in the Midwest and South where the numbers make better sense anyway? Two weeks ago, CFP Brent Sutherland and I discussed why conventional financial advisors don't discuss real estate with you. Last week, we had the hands-on perspective with Kevin Cross asking, should you self-manage your rental property and your tenants? For him, the answer is yes, with some help, and that's fine. For me, the answer is no. I want control on my real estate without having day-to-day type of responsibility. Let's do good in the world out there. Let's provide people with clean, safe, affordable, functional housing for sure. That's mission critical. But I want to make sure that my manager does that. I want to directly invest in real estate with property titled in my own name. That way I get paid up to five different ways. But I don't want real estate, I'll say, right in my grip. As in, I don't want to hold real estate right in my hand. Otherwise, Now it's on my plate and it's too close to the front burner, but I do want it within my arm's reach so that I have control and yet a fair measure of passivity. If you want more out of your life, you've got to go out on a limb. I'm going to talk about that with you today next. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. 71% of Americans aren't saving enough for retirement. It's going to get worse as people live longer, and you need to start thinking differently. But you can't lose your time. Real estate is the investment vehicle that's made more ordinary people wealthy than anything else. Keith Weinhold of Get Rich Education is host of one of America's top investing shows, Disrupting Wall Street. He's an international best-selling author, a writer for Rich Dad Advisors, and has been an active income property investor since 2002. He has created thousands in passive monthly income for countless followers, and now he has a free book, The Seven Principles for Creating Wealth in Your Life. Get your copy now at getricheducation.com forward slash book. That's getricheducation.com forward slash book because invest in what produces income for you now and later. Keith Weinhold is your guy. Sign up now at getricheducation.com forward slash book. Countless property investors get killed with maintenance costs, but that's far less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about JWB Real Estate Capital in Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build to rent model where you can invest in new construction turnkey rental properties. That's why JWB was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. To learn more and see inventory, go to newconstructionturnkey.com. This is Frank Gallinelli. To grow your wealth, listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. When it comes to your day job or how you spend most of your waking day, were you meant to be doing what you're doing now. I think that a lot of people get culturally conditioned that you have to take this one path and you must take this path throughout life. And if you deviate from it too much, then that's bad because now you're a non-conformer. Yes, one path. This narrative through the Industrial Revolution that you should go to school, get this amount of formal education, this amount of college debt, get a good job, work for one company, marriage, kids, buy a big house, get a new car every five to six years, just two or three weeks of vacation per year. My goodness, are you kidding me? (laughs) Work for 40 years, then retire and play golf or something like that, that one path. That's what's supposed to quote unquote guarantee the masses happiness, fulfillment, and meaning, but it often doesn't. So why settle for what the masses do? People are willing to trade away their authenticity in life for approval. Rather than being authentic, they instead settle for society's stamp of approval. Don't trade away your authenticity for approval. Parents and community and friends, they all taught you 
here's the one way you have to live, that one path. Well, why don't you instead custom design your best life? What does success look like to you? Is success being a doctor, lawyer, dentist, if you drive this nice of a car, or if you live in this neighborhood, or this nice of a house, or if your kids go to this school? Well, instead, your definition of success may very well be, are you doing the things that you dreamed about? Are you impacting others in a meaningful way? You can either live a life of safety or a life of creativity. Go out on a limb where that tree branch might yield a little 30 feet above the ground, scaring you. Go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. Understand that the consequence might be that fewer people will perceive you as a success. How you make your money is probably more important than how much money you make. We are get rich education, and get rich means living a rich life, whatever that means to you. When you're young and people ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? They're not really asking you what you want to be at all. They're asking, what do you want to do professionally to earn money? And that's why it feels risky to say, what you really want to be, to even say it. It feels risky to use an online platform to try to crowdfund your kitchen device invention. You're afraid you'll be seen as a failure when you share that ambition on Facebook and get ridiculed from your friends. That's going out on a limb. Trying to get your workout app featured on Shark Tank. That is not being a conformer, but that's where the great stuff can happen. Or it's doing what we focus on here, getting residual income from rental property to buy the time so then you can do what you really want to do or be who you really want to be. And it's more generationally proven than those strict entrepreneurial endeavors or inventions. And real estate, it's neither quick nor easy, but real estate is a stronger tree branch and your fruit is out there. If you get 40 rental doors that even cash flow just $150 a month each, that's $6,000 a month in rental income for you, or double that or 10x that if you need to for your cash flow requirements. Most people live inside this circle of certainty with their job and their life. That's a small circle. And in that small circle, we'll call it 100% safety and security. Now, if you enlarge your circle so that it surrounds the first one, you might now be living where you only have 80% certainty in your life's outcome. And if you make an even larger circle yet around the first two and really go for it, now your sense of certainty might be down to, say, 60%. But see, the one thing that you can be certain of then, if you made your life that big, is that you won't have any regrets. The number one regret of elderly people that are in a nursing home is that, gosh, I never tried blank, whatever that thing is for you. They didn't go out on a limb and they never tasted that sweet, succulent fruit. I can help tell you whether you're going out on a limb or not right now if you don't know. Do you know what the most powerful assignment is with regard to this? It's to write your own obituary. That's your assignment. Put pen to paper. If you must write your own obituary right now, you're going to have great clarity on if your accomplishments or your contributions or your current trajectory, if they're really putting you where you need to be. I think writing your own obituary can strike fear into you. It puts some fear into me. What would people say about what you did? What would you even write down about yourself as you write your own obituary? In over 6,000 years of recorded human history, no one has ever achieved anything outstanding by playing it safe. No one. The message is clear. You need to either accept the necessity for calculated risk 
or settle for way, way less than you deserve. Look, I've got this childhood friend from when I lived back in Pennsylvania. He's a nice guy. He's got a nice family now. He became a public school teacher, a math teacher, and today I see his posts on social media more often than I see him. And one of the things that he commonly posts about are that he complains about how public school teachers aren't treated well because he has disappointingly low pay. And I see a lot of his teacher friends chime in and make those Facebook comments under his posts, lamenting about the fact that they have low incomes and might even have to take second jobs in the summer or whatever. Well, after seeing a lot of these posts over time, I just commented on one of them with an actual solution to the problem just one time. My comment was something like, I wrote, many teachers that I know make $500,000 a year to $1 million a year and they have great control of their time. That's what I wrote. You should have seen the reaction. My friend and the other teachers on that thread, a lot of them were asking me, well, how could this be possible? Some of them even direct messaging me. And I said, these well-paid teachers are online teachers. Yeah, they wake up each morning and see how many video course subscriptions they sold overnight. You should have seen the reaction to that. They were quickly uninterested. Now, that sounded scary. That didn't meet conformity. That was going out on a limb. Now, I've got nothing against public school teachers. In fact, I appreciate what they do. But you can see how much fear there is with going out on a limb. See, when you try to provide a solution to people's problems, they'd usually rather stay small, stay secure, keep settling, Keep staying inside that 100% certainty, smaller life circle. Do you think that a public school teacher also, do you think they would agree that their 12-year-old student should be a lifelong learner? Yeah, they probably would agree with something like that. But is that public school teacher being a lifelong learner themselves if they won't provide a better life for themselves by learning some new online teaching and internet marketing skills? See, everyone wants change, but no one wants to change. This is not about condemning people for being employees or denigrating any profession. It's about removing that wall between you and what you want. Because look, you might be a highly compensated employee, just say, that actually wants to teach public school math or English to 12-year-olds, but you cannot afford to make the say. $55,000 a year that a teacher makes, but building a second income with something proven like real estate, that softens that financial blow. That might make it possible. It lubricates that transition to doing what energizes you if that's teaching English to 12-year-olds. This way, you're a teacher, but see, now you're not dissatisfied that your salary is low because teaching isn't where you started. And now you're probably more valuable to those 12-year-old students because you are where you really want to be, and that's going to show through. The riskiest thing you can possibly do is to stay safe and take zero risks because then you virtually guarantee that you'll never get the life that you could have had. Residual income gives you the ability to not really make more time, but leverage time And it might even provide some physical possessions for you along the way. I don't think there's anything wrong with adding some material stuff. Even if physical stuff isn't what life is about, it can help you facilitate your best life. Even a simple hiker would like a nice, comfortable backpack and a tent and a sleeping bag. Some people say that they want to live frugally, but you know, people only say that because they've been conditioned that way and they just don't know how to live better. When people say, I want to live frugally, often what they really want to say is I'd like to live well. Like I've said elsewhere, the great conundrum of modern society is that people spend all this time learning about how work works and zero time learning about how money works, yet money is the main reason that they even go to work. Hmm, can you believe that. Even if you're one of the fortunate few that does not want or desire a substantial life change, that's great. 
But you know what? Adding a monthly stream of real estate income on top of your current situation, that sure is not going to hurt you. Investing in real estate myself helped ease my transition from a day job to doing things like this show right now, creating value for people in the way that I want to do it. So I invest in especially this workforce type of housing myself. Earlier today, I talked about some of the economic and demographic reasons and the whys about these modest but decent rental single family homes and small apartment buildings that we so often favor here. And you know, as the American family size continues to shrink because birth rates keep falling, well, people want smaller single family homes. Just think about how people live. Smaller family sizes, that is a trend away from McMansions. Millennials and Gen Zers, they're also environmentally conscious people. That's the future where there's been this spurning of extravagance in the McMansions. So That's why these low-cost rental single-family homes are in such demand. In fact, a recent report by economic research consultancy Capital Economics, they shared a really stunning statistic. The number of vacant single-family homes for sale priced under $250,000, which is kind of that sweet spot, that range for income properties, the amount of those homes has been slashed in half since 2012. Yes, there are only half as many available now as then. In fact, according to the report, there are only 550,000 vacant homes on the market priced under 250K. That's half as many as there were eight years ago. That is astounding. And when there's a downturn, there always will be one, people will move from kind of these higher end $2,000 to $3,000 rental homes into yours where they pay more like $1,000 to $1,500 a month. In fact, I just bought two more of these rental single family homes last month myself. One was 150K and the other about 130K. And I bought them from GRE Turnkey. And you know, if you're on the edge with your next move and you don't know if you should invest in a property or invest in more education and you're trying to decide between those two, As long as you've got some education, I would err toward you putting another property in your portfolio or your first property. And why is that? That's because when you buy a property, you get substantial education about it from the inside. Buying and owning, that is the real world education that any classroom simulation doesn't replicate. Owning property gives you education but more education alone does not give you more property. So here, we both teach a man to fish or woman to fish and give you a fish. We do both. GREturnkey.com is where I've done my own property buying for years, including where I purchased these most recent two. Go there, read a couple reports in some markets that interest you, and get some property under contract. Over there right now, I can tell you that in Alabama, Birmingham and Huntsville have been furnishing income property pretty actively. In Ohio, Dayton has been bringing inventory to the market that exceeds a 1% rent-to-value ratio, meaning that you can get more rent income per invested dollar there than nearly anywhere else. Further south, Memphis and Little Rock have similar profitability to Dayton, and there are some really low price points in Memphis if you're looking to just get started. Then Jacksonville has brand new construction turnkey property and actually have investor houses available right now. Lower cash flow there, but brand new. Then in Tampa, Florida, you can get a little cash flow and the Tampa St. Pete Metro, that was the second highest appreciation market in the nation this past year at 5%. Yes, year over year, Tampa was second and you can get cash flow in the submarkets north of there. Tampa has been furnishing, oh, maybe four or five turnkey properties onto the market each month. And yeah, see, as noted, inventory is tight nearly everywhere. You can't just make these things up. These are real properties. And in Tampa, you're looking at something like $1,200 of rent income for a $150,000 property. At GRE Turnkey, Chicagoland has an interesting dynamic where you're investing in Chicago suburbs of northwestern Indiana. That way you get the proximity and you get the economic diversification of a world-class city like Chicago, 
Yet being on the Indiana side of the state line gives you property taxes that are less than half of that if you were on the Illinois side. Everything I'm discussing here is designed for out-of-the-area investors like me and probably you too. It's turnkey, meaning that the property is fully renovated under a property manager's management and often even occupied with a tenant on the day that you buy so that you're enjoying that mailbox money or that ACH bank draft money as it might be. You can find all those providers and more at greturnkey.com. A big thanks to, well, Mark Twain for some inspiration today. Why not go out on a limb? That's where the fruit is. I'm back next week with Tom Wheelwright. Until next week, get started at greturnkey.com. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.